Welcome to Cly Calling. Cly Calling is a series of events arranged by Norfolk Wildlife Trust, most of which, of course, in this exceptional year, are online. And you can find out about all the upcoming events at our website, clycalling.com. That's clycalling.com. Now I'll join you again in a moment with a number of bits of information about how this evening will go, but having welcomed you, I want to welcome our guest this evening, who is the wonderful Dr. Erica McAllister, joining us from the Natural History Museum. Good evening, Erica. Good evening. Slightly far away from the Natural History Museum tonight oh. in Cumbria, but oh, yes. yes. You're in Cumbria this same yeah. evening. <laughs> yes. Because you live there or because you're on a jaunt? Uh, a jaunt, but I'm slightly obsessed with the hoverflies up here. There's a lot of amazing flies at the moment, so it's great. I have been seeing, you've been tweeting about ivy a lot. Yes. Yes, I'm not going to blame the flies. I was cycling yesterday up from the coast and I, because the ivy was all along the hedges, I kept bumping into wasps <laughs> because they were all across the road. Some of them, of course, may have been hoverflies. Um, so what's the best hoverfly that you've seen in your jaunt to Cumbria? Um, oh, um, well, yesterday I saw a Volicella pellucens, which obviously you know very well, and it's, it's a big fat, fat hoverfly, and it, it's drunk on the ivy, it's bumbling around, it's falling all over the place. Absolutely lovely to see these big species, in, you know, just walking down the road, the neighbour here was like, excuse me, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, hoverflies, obviously. I suspect that this evening mostly will be people saying to Erica McAllister, excuse me, what are you doing? <laughs> but, but just to add about Volicelli Pellucens, in fact, it is a considerable friend of mine. And if you go back to my tweets in August time, when the um, uh, silver washers <laughs> were out in swarms in Foxywood, Norfolk Wildlife Trust Reserve, you will see a photograph of Volicelli Pellucens on my Twitter. But before we come back to you, Erica, and your wonderful book, The Inside Out of Flies, I need just to cover a few things for the wonderful people who are joining us from all over the world. Thank you for being with us. First thing that's really, really important to say is we're extremely grateful to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who are funding the programme of events from now onwards, including this evening. And in particular, they are keen to hear about new people who might not otherwise have engaged with the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, have engaged with events such as Cly Calling, perhaps might not otherwise have engaged with Erica and Flies, because we are out on a limb, of which we have a number, and we should be learning about that later on, about fly limbs. Um, so if you are new to Norfolk Wildlife Trust and our events, please, please, please do let us know. And you'll have received an email which contains the details of David Fieldhouse, who is our wonderful producer this evening and works at our CLI Norfolk Wildlife Trust Visitor Centre. So please give feedback on this evening and our other events. And especially if you're a new person to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, we'd love that. This is a free event. However, should you be so moved by Erica's flies this evening, <laughs> you wish to donate millions and millions of pounds to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, we would be delighted to hear from you. And in the same email, there is a link so to do. But most importantly of all, there's a link uh, through which you can buy Erica's book, The Inside Out of Flies, literally hot off the press. Erica's waving. I haven't seen a printed copy. I've been reading a PDF. You need to say something for people to be able to see you, Erica. Oh, okay. Here it is. Here it is. This was number one copy that I've been sent. And it's like, I know, which is like, oh, so this is... The original number one and then this one so these are like these are like my children <laughs> that's I, how weird my life is now i'm sure that both of them are available from our partners wild sounds and books um but in yes. particular this evening wild sounds is very generously making an offer on erica's the inside out of flies which came out only last week and for your purchase duncan wild sounds and books will make a 10 percent donation to Norfolk wildlife trust for which we are enormously grateful so follow the link that's in the email please you 
of course, can ask questions of Erica later this evening. Should you think of something, we may not be able to fit all of them in because I'm starting to get the impression there are groupies out there. There are fly groupies who follow Erica around. And so if you have questions, please ask us. Some of them we'll try and enable you to ask them directly. Some of them I will read aloud and apologies in advance if we don't manage to get round to them all. And the final thing is, should for some reason you have to leave, this will be uploaded to YouTube around a couple of weeks after the event finishes. So thank you all very much for listening to all that. Erica. Hello. Good evening. Now, I have a suspicion that somewhere there is a Russian oligarch who funds fly obsessive, obsessives. You seem to be the Fly Appreciation Society. Your mission in life is to make us understand and love flies. So if I can quote a couple of things from the book here, I do think that they have some incredibly poor PR and this needs correcting. And then slightly further on, which gives, I think, a bit more of a flavour of your character. There is something very attractive about the abdomen of an engorged tsetse fly. Remember, everybody else, this is a fly that causes sleeping sickness and all sorts of other problems. The across fly the does not cause sleeping sickness. I stand correct. The trypanosome causes sleeping sickness. The uh, fly is, uh, is being used by another organism. The, the fly is an innocent vector. Thank you. I apologise to tsetse flies all over Africa. There is something very attractive about the abdomen of an engorged tsetse fly. <laughs> Larger tracheae can now be seen clearly as large ribbon-like structures that wrap the abdomen, causing it to look like radicchio, the Italian chicory. Um, do, you, do, do you have anything to say in your defence, Erica McAllister? Um, there's a lot of other people like me out there we, um, I'm part of several literary organisations, there's a UK one, and then there's a global one. And every four years, we get together, and there's about 400 of us that meet in these global dipterology conferences. And um, if you've got any slight sensitivities towards certain things, such as death, genitalia, maggots, feces, they're not probably your events, but otherwise, they're really, really, really good fun. I, I have a sense from reading your book and from our brief conversations in advance of this evening that actually dip, dipterologists, are you dipterologists or dipterists? Both. Both, you yeah. can go both ways. I think you're probably rather a fun group of taxonomists <laughs> yes. and scientists. Um, I have to say that you are the 12th author I've interviewed this year, um, a 12th author who's brought out a new book on natural history, wildlife, landscape this year. And you are the very first who has been virtually stalked via my social media. So I think you have quite a quite a following out there. People have sent me messages saying, oh my God, you're interviewing Erica McAllister. She's <laughs> amazing. And, um, you're the first. and there have been some very, very big names in that list. So back to flies. Taxonomically speaking, Erica, what makes a fly a fly? Oh, do you know what this is? We, let's start with the worst question. Um, so technically, at flies are one of the orders of insects we're all happy with that and morphology morphologically we we go on what the adults look like not the larvae the larvae are in a completely different bracket as well now flies go through complete metamorphosis so their little ones don't resemble the adults like a, unlike a say a dragonfly larvae who although is living in water they basically look like adults without the wings but flies as we all know go through this complete change and as an adult, there's three defining features. One is the suctorial mouth parts. So you have never been bitten by a fly. You've been sliced, shredded, pierced, maimed, deformed, and all of those lovely things, but you haven't, because they haven't got like mandibles in the same way. Now, you've probably been bitten by a horse fly or been sliced by a horse fly, and I believe that's very painful as she's slicing through. And so she's got some hardened edges. But you know what? It's most of the time it's just, just piercing. So it's this suctorial mouth part. Um, they've all got one pair of wings. So this is how you can, when you're looking at your ivy bush and everyone goes, oh, it's all bees. And I go, stop, wait, have a look. Hi bees and with the other hymenoptera, like the wasps and things like that, they have two pairs of wings. 
flies are so efficient, they don't need a second pair. And what instead they have is their final defining feature is a pair of halters. Now these are these like knob-like structures that are at the back of the thorax behind the wings. And there it's gyroscopic uh, receptors, it's proprioceptors. So it enables flies to see how they're flying in relation to everything else. So flies are the best flyers on the planet. People like birds, when, when you move on to the more developed species like the flies, you understand, because they can yaw, they can roll, they can do all sorts of things, they can reverse, they can land upside down. And the physics behind being able to do that is quite extraordinary. Now, I've said there's three things that make a fly, but there's loads of flies that have no mouth parts, no wings, no ulcers. They've just taken their morphological blueprint and just laughed at it. And so you're often sitting staring at a fly going, I know you're a fly, I really, I really do, but I'm really having a problem trying to explain to everyone else why actually you're a fly. So they're, they're, they're good fun to look at. They certainly are, and I must say that your book is peppered with astonishing illustrations of the beauty, the tremendous diversity of lives, and there are some that look for all the world like lice, and there are some that look for oh. all the world. Are you talking about the little bee riders? Yes, yes. Oh, aren't they adorable? <laughs> um, yeah, see, see these little creatures, and they're, they're just harmless little things, just feeding off the the crap that the queen bee leaves around her mouth. So they're going doing that. And they look like little teddy bears. They it, are. It's not just their appearance that's incredible because they also are able to do some pretty amazing pheromonal things, aren't they? Yeah, which, I mean, this is the one thing that's really interesting. We've been looking at flies for hundreds, thousands of years. And only recently are we beginning to answer some of these really quite fun questions like how on earth the queen isn't throwing off this thing that's basically in relation to her, the size of her hand, walking around her body and feeding from, say, her beard. You know, if you're sitting there in a pub and suddenly this kind of creature comes along and starts nibbling at your watsits in your, in your beard, you'd be like, yeah, I think there's something going on here. But the fact that this queen is totally happy for this to go on is, is something else. And then just before we get up, uh, talking of weird, complete weirdo flies, um, also <laughs> illustrated in your book. Uh, well, <laughs> forgive me, but, but your book is so full of examples of extraordinary, extraordinary creatures. Um, and then there are flies that effectively have got rid, as adults, of all external body parts to become little, little mini maggoty people, haven't they? Well, it's, it's the, the female that wants it's a type of bat fly, and once she's copulated, she rips her legs off, she rips, rips her wings off, she invaginates her head into her body cavity, and then just sticks this in the side of the bat, where she just gestates and feeds. It's like, that is the most extreme mother I think I know of. It's fascinating. And, you know, that's probably one of the only ways I'd be a mother. If you just said, you just have to, like, feed and do nothing else, it's like, this is brilliant. <laughs> you do uh, light up when you talk about some of the quirkier of the flies. But just to talk about, for people who are interested in buying your book, and I cannot encourage you enough to buy this book because it is mind-blowingly full of extraordinary examples of the diversity of life. Um, but the structure, effectively, for, I'm going to quote a couple of things from the book which explain, really, the structure of the book. Very early on, you say, from the tip of their antennae to the end of their anal spiracles, flies are as fantastical as they are different. And then at the end of that section, this book will take you through the bodies of these little wonders, from their antennae to their anal spiracles, from the commonplace to the extraordinary, showing you how modifications have enabled the proliferation of these species and also inspired us humans in the development of our own technology. So effectively, you start at the front end and you move backwards through the book, don't you? Yeah. So um, it was quite good because as a dipterist, obviously, we're fascinated by genitalia. So it's like leaving the best to last. But what was, what was great is that, what in writing this, you realize that there's so much information and trying to just filter through and just pick out key things. I mean, you could write 10,000 of those books when it comes to flies, because the model organism on the planet is a fly. 
So we've been studying the genetics of just one species for over a hundred years now. So there's so much information wrapped up in one fly. And another fly, or two species of another fly, the mosquitoes, have arguably had the most impact on human cultivation and civilization. And so we have been studying them for an awfully long time as well. So when it comes to understanding certain animals, flies are some of the most researched in the world. But you get rid of, say, those 10 flies, and there's a whole lot more to go. And so it, it's been fascinating trying to find out why their antennae look like certain ways. So there's some that, so the antennae are the ears, they listen with them. But there's some that look like massive paddles. There's some that look like nets. There's the feather dusters that we, we recognize in our midges. There's all of these different shapes and functions. We're only just beginning to understand what all these mean and how they, how they work, how they function. I mean, flies have hearts in their heads. So they have these little hearts, these little pumps are pumping out all of this information their antennae is telling them. And so it's just like, I didn't know that head, they have hearts everywhere. They have hearts in their knees. They have hearts in their genitalia, which, which you know, I'm making no, no comment about that. But it, they have all these amazing structures going on. So it's fascinating to be able to travel through the body and go, wow, I had no idea about that. And you do. Each chapter is uh, more remarkable than the last until you get to uh, <laughs> the brushes on the rear end and all of the apparatus of mating, which really is truly, truly extraordinary. It does uh, the, the, the book. It's, it, uh, I think it's the, flag, it's the flags on the backside of a dolly capode. So these little flags that can kind of like, is he semaphoring with his bottom? Is this really what's going on here? And it's like, Ah, do you know what? They must have the funniest times, flies. Their flirting is truly extraordinary. They are, of all the animals, they've got more body modifications for flirting than anything else. They're just cheeky little things. I like the idea of body modification. There's a certain, you think of the heavily tattooed and heavily pierced among humans, and they're probably our closest examples of flies because they've got all this <laughs> stuff, all this signaling going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Body modification is where it's at. Um, now, Erica, one of the things that really, obviously, you're in awe of, and you play um, against vertebrates a little bit, or indeed other groups of insects, she rolls her eyes. Um, you, you can't be seen when you're not speaking, but she's rolling her eyes here. Um, I want to read you... That a was a lie, about... one. That was a lie. I never did anything like that. Did I you not? Know, I'm going to read you at yourself at this point, a few quotations, because it is so extraordinary, the diversity of species of structure and modifications, as you say, and also of lifestyle. I mean, flies really, I'm a convert. I'm t I was always a fan, but I'm totally a convert. So humans first started studying and writing about flies about 2000 years ago when Pliny the Elder talked about them in what is regarded as one of the oldest natural history books ever written his Historia Naturalis. In a beautiful turn of phrase, Pliny writes that within the insects, of which flies are a major component, in no one of her works has nature more fully displayed her exhaustless ingenuity. And one or two more. Um, nevertheless, arthropods are incredibly successful. They dominate both the terrestrial and marine environments. They laugh at the fragility of birds, poke <laughs> fun at the armour of mammals and mock the lack of flexibility in snakes. Within the arthropods, it is the insects that rule. And finally, they are, this is of flies, of course, they are one of the mega rich orders with to date 160,000 or so species described from approximately 190 families. No one can quite agree on the number of families, but whatever it currently stands at, we can be sure this current species estimate is woefully below the real figure. It's as if flies are hell bent on being the most morphologically complicated creatures on the planet. So, ah, the flies. wherefore this extraordinary diversity of form, of function, of beauty? Yeah, the, they, um, they're so plastic. Uh, it's, it's, it's completely held by their larvae as well. And what most people, especially you vertebrate people, you forget about the larval stage. Now the larval stage is a really important stage. So you've got 
with so with insects, say with most animals, you have an egg, and then you have the immature going into the adult, and there's really no huge morphological change. Okay, but what's happened with these insects that go through complete metamorphosis is that that egg stage they've broken it to have another feeding stage before they have kind of like a secondary egg stage, the pupa, where they develop more and become this adult. So this, this is an extraordinary thing that has enabled them to do lots of other things, i.e. make themselves incredibly fat and full of nutrients, full of uh, energy for the adult stage. So these maggots that everyone hates in your um, decomposing matter, be it fecal, be it vegetable, be it dead bodies, etc. They are, they are converting this nutrient. They're able to exist in a habitat that nobody else wants to, to provide the adults with a really good start. And a lot of these that, that live in your compost are the hoverflies. So not only have you got this amazing larvae that's adapted to living in a really anoxic, really nasty environment and not getting any bacterial infections itself, it's doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And then you've got a complete to change in the adult, in the, in the actual morphology of the adult and the feeding behavior of the adult. So this niche separation has enabled flies to go, okay, I've had my kids, right, you can go and I can go off and I can do something completely different now and everything's great. Well, they are quite, quite remarkable and the I thoroughly encourage people to, to read your book. And one of the things that's so beautiful about it is how deeply personal your story with flies mm -hmm. is. And there's some lovely uh, moments all through the book, your own experiences. And I want to read to you um, from one of your um, adventures. Armed with what looked like a Ghostbusters power pack, in fact, a portable suction sampler that hoovers up the flies, I spent three frustrating weeks walking around the base of a volcano trying to catch them, a process that left me questioning my life choice of being a fly botherer. One particularly <laughs> No point. Was it <laughs> PM one this night? is such a bad story. I should never have admitted to <laughs> One particularly low point was at 11 p.m. one night when I found myself vacuuming, vacuuming mosquitoes from a tethered but very amorous bull. It was half an hour of pure adrenaline as I tried to collect mosquitoes from him without him gaining any access to me. I've never you been more grateful for a sturdy rope. <laughs> You should have seen me. I was by myself. I was in the shed. And what, what I couldn't say was that the poor farmer, he was so excited, he, he lit a fire beforehand, which gets rid of all the mosquitoes. So I was like, oh no. And so he said, he keeps popping back in. He's like, are you again? I'm like, yeah, this is slightly pointless. And the only flies I could see were on the ball. And I'm like, oh, you're kidding me now. So I'm approaching it with this big sheep. It's like, hello, I haven't seen someone like you before. And I'm like, no, my friends back home are in the pub and I'm here hoovering a ball and this is quite bad. And you know, when you start, you start going down that, like feeling slightly sorry for yourself. But then I was in Indonesia and it was very nice. And we did find a new species of fly. So it kind of all worked out, but it still makes me cringe when I think of that story. But not enough that you didn't include it in the book, and happily, no. for, <laughs> happily for those of us who um, have had, I've had the privilege of reading the book and thoroughly enjoyed it, it's, it's peppered with these humorous moments that, that give a, an idea of who Erica is and, and why you're so dippily in love with Dictera, if I may. Um, now, I want to you please, Erica, because this is really important to your story, and again, this is a taxonomic one, but there's, there's a single, albeit artificial, basic division in flies between Masterus species who are paraphyletic, and you better yeah. explain that, please, and the Brachycerum flies. So for our less dipteran uh, or dipterist uh, viewers this evening, explain what that basic division is all about. Okay, so... This is all the flies together. This is my uh, English mustard, oh, and French mustard. That's quite interesting. And so they're all mustards, so we can all understand all of that. But originally, we just looked at the antennae of these two groups. Basically, these had short antennae, and these had very long antennae. Okay, so these are your midges, your mosquitoes, your crane flies, and whatever. 
Now, then we started looking properly into their evolutionary history. And we were like, these ones with all their short antennae, actually they do sit well together. If we can go back, we can relate well, we can understand, we can see where lineages split, etc. This lot, we realized it wasn't just a jar of French mustard. It was a jar of American mustard and Australian mustard and all these different sorts of mustards. But because we called them mustard and they all kind of look like mustard, we'd all shove them together. So what we're now figuring out, we go back and we're trying to find the ancestor of this French mustard and see how these flies relate to each other in that way. To the point, like the crane flies, there's still lots of arguments whether they're some of the most primitive flies or some very advanced flies. So we are arguing at that sort of level within the flies. So in a lot of ways, we call them lower flies and higher flies, because we, but we don't want to imply that some flies are better than other flies. And just because things evolved before something else doesn't mean it's, it's less advanced than the, the one that's evolved recently. So there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work going on. And because of the plasticity, because of the morphology of these annoying but wonderful beasts, we are now relying a lot more on genetic techniques. So this is hopefully uncovering a lot of problematic species that we have. And just the, the way that I think of it, having read your book, and I, I'm quite interested in hoverflies, um, if you gave a child a crayon and asked the child to draw a fly, they would draw a brachycerum. Yes. They, would draw, they would draw a plump fly with two big wings and a round face, really short antennae, a fly-shaped fly, and all of the gangly, freaky weirdos are the... the Are you calling a crane fly a gangly, freaky weirdo? I am actually, I am being a reasonably gangly freaky weirdo myself. <laughs> they are pretty much my spirit animal. And just to explain, to be abundantly clear, you, you, the mustard example explained very clearly this word paraphyletic, but it's a, it's a, it means a, a group which seems yes. to be more or less the same thing, but which actually has a whole bunch of different origins. Yeah, I mean, the good, uh, we call it like a bucket. Well, I mean, you just throw them all in because they kind of look alike. So Drosophila, those vinegar flies, which everyone calls fruit flies, that genus is a bucket genus. It's more like people have gone, I don't know, I don't know what it is. Oh gosh, call it Drosophila. I mean, it's not that bad, honestly, but there are times when you're like, it, because it needs to be sorted out. And, and we know it's going to take a lot of effort, especially when with, for example, Drosophila, you've got thousands of species. So uh, huge amounts of money, <laughs> needs to be thrown at taxonomy, which sadly has been missing recently. And just to go off on a tangent, because this blew my mind and it's just popped into my mind, Drosophila, who can smell with their wings. Yeah, I know. What's that all about? Hey, it's great, isn't it? It's like, oh, oh hello, what's going on? I, it's, it's, first of all, it's tasting with your feet, smelling with your wings, it's listening with your feathers. It's all sorts of things you're like, hold on, why, what, what is going on? But yeah, so there's the Drosophila that do it. We know Tifritids do it. So arguably, we're, we're trying to think, actually, is there more and more flies? We've only just started looking at such few species. If we actually start looking all around, who knows what sort of crazy stuff we're going to find? Quite, quite extraordinary. Now, going, I'm, I'm not, sadly, we're not going to have time to cover all of the amazing body parts that you cover in the book. But eyes um, and the three words that I underlined um, as I went through were nipples, <laughs> mazes and love spots. Uh, do you have, again, do you have anything to say in your defence it, Eric McAllister? It's not me! Hmm. I am just repeating science. So you cannot have a go at me. So I had to, a lovely well, I man, I got I, go, I can have a slight go at you because here, um, here you say any reputation I had with my students as a proper grown-up scientist was lost when they saw me walking and giggling around the cheap chasing the male fly. Um, that's of stork-eyed flies. So you do have form for flies with weird eyes. Yeah, no, no, that stork eyes are amazing. Very but nice. I got to send an email to the head of the scanning unit in the museum go, please, can you scan my nipples? And he's like, uh, it, you know, anyone else? He goes, anyone else? I would have just banned this email, but I knew yours had to be about flies. I just couldn't figure what on earth it was. And it's like, no, it's the eyes of mosquitoes, obviously. And um, so he's like, I, I just knew it. I knew you'd be doing something weird. 
Um, yeah, and um, stalk eyes. I was, at, so I was doing some field work in Ethiopia and the first time I've properly like seen these headbutt each other and, and they, they joust like deer and they're on a tiny, tiny log about so big, all these little males. And then they would just go and fight each other and it's like, oh, that is just amazing. But to know what is going, what's happened morphologically before these actual eye stalks have even developed, the development of the optic nerve in the head as it, and it recoils um, it's, it's just a, not recall, it's the opposite of recall, stretches out. It's just fascinating to know. And so not only are, are they amusing and funky, they're, they're also highly uh, developed for what they are. Amusing and funky and highly developed would be a wonderful description of your good self, I think, after, after this conversation. Um, <laughs> but back to stalk flies. Now, not talking specifically about the group here that's called stalk eyed flies but you make the point that having stalk eyes has evolved 22 different times separately in flies which is yeah. quite quite remarkable yeah females obviously love it um it, it's it's just obviously one of those things that she's like how can we make the males look more erotic than possible oh do you know what they can do that and there's um some of the like the achaeus rostradii its eye stalks are about an inch apart, you know, they're, they're, they're huge. And for this beast to be able to fly, to be able to not be caught on the wing by anything else is, a, is an amazing testament to the, the individuals themselves. Um, some of them, most of the time, the, the females aren't stalk eyes. There are a few examples of stalk eyes and it's like, why have the females got them? So um, there's still we have to know. And then the other ones with their, their moose cheeks, as well, which I, I think I just like, really? How on earth did that happen in the first place? He was like, some female went, do you know what? I prefer that male with those silly little things coming out of his cheek. Let's all have his offspring. And it, it, it is just how all these things get picked in the first place. I don't know. Quite, quite remarkable. But flies also have all sorts of extraordinary implications for human society and this is where you really are the poster guy poster girl for flies and for the, the the community of fly lovers so you you write this much is written about the wonders of bee vomit aka honey but it turns out maggot vomit is just as wonderful um what what were you what what, what were you meaning there erica well it's a it's a, it's a very good medicinal thing okay so the enzymes so Debridement therapy. There's a there's there's a maggot nurse. I I am not the queen of the maggots. That title goes elsewhere. I'm afraid. One day it may be mine, but not yet. But anyway, she she does she works with debridement therapy, and um, we have it in the NHS. So I thoroughly recommend the next time you cut yourself open, when you're crying and sobbing to someone in the the local hospital, say stop. Do you have debridement therapy here? Because actually it'd be very good. Because when the maggots are feasting on the necrotic flesh, if anyone's got any sensitivities, I'm very sorry. But when it's feeding on the, it, the, the maggots themselves will release a digestive enzyme, but that enzyme is incredibly good at getting rid of all the bacteria in the skin and around it. So the, the incidence of gatching MRSA and things like that massively decreases in hospital, but it also causes the skin to release uh, more collagen and it binds better. So if you, if you afterwards go and look up a load of YouTube videos for a fun Thursday night of people who've had debridement therapy and people who haven't, and look at the state of their wounds. And this, uh, interestingly, is gonna be more important now because of type two diabetes, because we get massive ulcerating wounds associated with type two diabetes, really, really difficult to cure, but one of the things that does it are your munching maggots. And because of people probably like you, who are slightly more sensitive to maggots eating away at them, they now come in little tea bag things. So they can be applied, you don't see them, but they, they're, they're basically a maggot. These, these species are sleeping bags full of, say, vegetable soup with a little hook at the end. I mean, there's no structural form. And this little hook is able to reach through the tea bag and is able to scrape away at the dead flesh. And then 24 hours later, tea bag is removed and you have a new one on. Bish, bash, bosh. A couple of weeks later, you've got a perfectly healed hand. 
I, I admire that enormously. And, but I do resent that people like you, because I will have you know that during the decade I lived in South America, I was a number of times host to Dermatobia hominis. I am so jealous about this. I spend so much time in Central South America. I, I, you know, I have spent years doing field work out there and not once have I personally had it. Do you want to describe to our listeners what Dermatobia hominis is and does? Well, if anyone was on Twitter, have a look at my tweet today, because I tweeted the larval stage of one that was removed from the editor of BBC Wildlife's wife's head on their honeymoon. And he nicely brought it into the collection for me. So it's now part of the NHM collection. Instead. So Dermatobia hominis is one of the oostrids and oostrids is more commonly called bot fly. Now, um, it's, I love bot flies. There's three different types of bot fly depending on where they exist in you. So there's the human bot fly, which is the Dermatobia hominis. And um, that is a subdermal one. So it gets under your skin. My friend had got one on his head, which was great because I could watch it develop. But um, he was a primatologist, so it was a bit more, you know, a bit more sensitive. I, I, had, one, I had one here. Did you let it grow? No, no, because it was right against bone and it was really painful. Well, you say that. But anyway, I, I think you should have let it grow because it's amazing. Apparently, when it's night, you can hear it munching. Did you hear it munching? I could feel it munching. Yes. OK. And did it leak? Yes, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was immaculately clean. There was, there was this bright clear, it was like a mountain spring. <laughs> oh, I'm so jealous. Um, so we've got those. In the UK, you can get bot flies as well, which is quite exciting. Yes, no, and in fact, one turned up last week in Norfolk, which is very nice. Uh, they're the sheep nasal bot fly. And because if people hang around with sheep, not uh, in Norfolk, they don't, not in Norfolk. You weren't careful where you cast aspersions. Uh, but they are regularly turning up in, uh, they used to be more common, obviously, when we actually went out with the sheep. Not went out with sheep, that's, that's a completely different thing. But we went and we, we tended our flocks. And these are nasal bot flies, so they're specifically there. So <coughs> you get those. My favourite bot fly is the camel bot fly camel nose bot fly, and you can get about 200 in the nasal cavity. And the nasal ones I affectionately call snot bots because it, it, they, the two, for the, the larvae to, to leave its larval habitat, it irritates the lining and causes the animal, the host, to sneeze violently. So in this kind of mucal puddle, you can have all these writhing bot flies going on, which must be some, something to behold. It would be great. <laughs> Going back to the human ones, uh, do you want to explain to our listeners uh, how the bot fly came, I mean, I've had them in other places too, but how the bot fly came to be in my brow? Because it's quite remarkable. This, yeah, I mean, this still blows my mind. I, I, how this sort of behavior has evolved. I, I, it, it shows you how ingenious these little creatures are. So the bot fly adult is quite large. It's quite cumbersome. It's a bumble. So imagine a bumblebee, it's slightly smaller than the big queen bumblebees, but a good size. And so you can see it, it's going zzzz. And, and even us humans are not that daft to let something maybe trying to attack us get that close. So these little bot flies have decided there's another attack they must take. And so instead they either capture something like a housefly, but more often than not, it's going to be a horsefly or mosquito, which the females, and these females need a blood meal to, to, for their egg development. So what this bot fly does is grab a mosquito, lays its eggs on it. And so when this mosquito is feeding off you and maybe giving you dengue, you could also be getting a bot fly in the same go. It's, it's, a, it's a, a crazy thing how this has actually started in the first place. What, what were the bot flies thinking? Do you think they were just seeing these mosquitoes going towards humans going, do you know what? I've got a plan. This is amazing. It is quite... It's extraordinary. Also, for the record, I have had dengue a couple of times oh, too. Oops. So I've had the, the whole set. No, don't you worry about it. Um, uh, that, was, that was a long time ago when I lived in South America. Um, back to medical applications of flies, because I took you off on a tangent there. Um, mosquito mouthparts and painless hypodermics. Quite, <laughs> quite extraordinary. 
I, I find it amazing that there's something the the actual process of a mosquito piercing you and extracting blood, which is the thing that most humans will categorically say is the worst thing ever. And because there is a transmission of all sorts of things that it can be, you know, very, very detrimental, is actually something that we're considering as beneficial for other applications. So it's very hard for you to determine when a mosquito by, uh, pierces your skin. Okay, we rarely feel it at the time, but you will feel it afterwards when there's a histamine reaction. So brains cleverer than myself have been like, hold on a minute, what's going on here? And these people have been looking at the ovipositors, the egg laying tube of wasps and things like that, and the mouth parts of mosquitoes going, how on earth, what on earth is going on? Because underneath the surface of the skin, they are able to move their mouth parts around to get to the best capillaries. So they've got no vision and they're able to move this kind of bendy straw around, which has got specific sensors at the end of it, which is able to chemically determine where the blood is, where the capillaries are, what's going on. And so we're like, hold on, not only can it pierce the skin without we noticing, it can find the best organelle that it's looking for. So we're developing these smart needles for when we're doing highly invasive surgery around they're near very sensitive tissues, you know, sensitive organs that we can manipulate to go around them. So it's quite, you know, in 10 years time, people will be like, that's an amazing surgery. And it's like, yep, mosquito mouth part was that. Quite, quite extraordinary. Again, it is, your book is just full of this stuff. That page after page, I'll be going, you're kidding. That's incredible. That's amazing. Although I disagree with you about mosquitoes not feeling them. I, this, when I lived in Amazonia, I, I used to be able to identify different genera of mosquitoes by the feel of their bite. Nice. Yeah, I, I should do more work with you then. I, I'm still, I, I try to identify flies when I swallow them cycling around London. That is going to be like my weird party trick, but that's not quite as useful in the same I, way. I don't think it shows a great deal of self-knowledge that you think that's your weird party trick. I think <laughs> there's, there's a range what going What are you saying? <laughs> well, I'll leave that to our, to our viewership. Um, abdomens, because they really are, that's, that's where your passion lies. I mean, this, the title of this section really is Let's Talk About Sex Baby, isn't it? It's... <laughs> it's um, Flies are quite, quite, quite extraordinary in terms of, let me find something, um, something good to challenge you here. But the parts that fascinate me the most are the genitals. I mean, there are species of flies whose male appear to have genital whips and others with big feather duster looking structures and not to be outdone, the males, some uh, by the males, some females have impressive egg-laying structures called ovipositors that resemble tin openers. And then specifically of Hilara and Hilarempis flies when they are made to, oh, she's, you, you know where I'm going here. Yeah. By the way, males bearing gifts, if lucky, still face a logistical nightmare when copulating. The male, sometimes whilst in mid-flight, has to support both the female and the gift as during some of the time she is feeding, she is not actively flying. That is an incredible load that he is supporting. Next time you whinge about the demands of your partner, <laughs> think, think about what these males have to go through. These newly married husbands have to carry their bride and presence across the threshold simultaneously. Um, talk to us about fly um, rear ends. Well, the rear ends, there's, there's multiple or many different varieties. Um, with the, the, the nematocerans, those lower flies, you can see a lot of their genitalia. Um, with the lower brachycerans, again, but a lot of their genitalia with the higher flies is hidden. And after death, you have to pop them open to be able to get the structures out. So you have to be very careful that you have killed the fly correctly because there's been times where I've tried to pull out the male genitalia and be like, oh no, he's still alive, this is awkward. Um, it's all right, it's fine. But um, they are, we used to think of it as a very primitive lock and key system, as with all, but we now know there's a, there's a whole lot more going on in there. And ditris, when you do hang around with groups of ditris, it's really quite bad because they all sit there and go, female genitalia is so boring. And I'm like, I'm not going to take it personally. And now we're beginning to understand because the female genitalia, they can do a lot more chemically. There's a lot more crazy stuff going on. There is basically a wall in there. 
So the, the male, the first part is to get his sperm as far inside her as possible. So she has the least chance of killing it. So he has all these sperm pumps. He has, uh, some of them don't just have pumps. Some of them would do it as packages. They have tickling organs, they have whips. Um, there's a whole lab in Singapore dedicated to studying one family of flies and the different ways that they are mate. So if you really want to lose yourself in some weird fly viewing, I, I would recommend this, this lab to look up in Singapore. You could probably, maybe don't just put that in, in Google like that. But it is, it is extraordinary because the competition is so great. Um, I, like, they, we're trying to figure out now if we can actually use the chemicals that the females are using for Barlow control. Is basically, she's doing a really good job at killing off her species because only the very, very best will actually survive to get food to her. So we're, we're, we're beginning to understand these chemicals and look at them. And, but the morphological, the Raphamaya has got the, the curliest, whirliest uh, penis that you've possibly ever seen. I mean, I talk with my mammal friends and they are like people who study mammals, not just like humans. And, and they, the, the, the most exciting genitalia we can think of is an echidna. And that is quite extraordinary. And then I'm like, yeah, but hold on, look at all of these. And I, I had a, a, I did some filming with David Attenborough. And I, <laughs> he's name like- Name drop, name drop. Yeah, I know, it gets better though. Cause he's like, I said, oh, I study. We're talking about fleas and flies. And then, and then we were talking about penises. I really don't know how it got onto it so quickly. But anyway, and I said, here, do you want to see this dolly, this dolly penis? Because it is extraordinary. And he looked at it and he went, wow. And then he looked at the film crew and went, well, I feel very inadequate now. And I'm like, oh, David, no. And he was like, oh, well, we, with some of them, we, we, and, you know, some of them, there's a, a photo I have in there of a forehead. And it's a corkscrew. And you know, how, how does one species have this thought through? And then very closely related uh, flies have something completely different. It's amazing. I like the, the anal glands of the forests, which are those like big pillowcases that blows up at the back of a, a female and the male just like shoves his head in them. And it's like, what do they smell like? What, what is going on to attract the males to this kind of like ah, frenzy going on in her glands? Fascinating. While we are talking fascinating rear ends of flies, um, you describe one fly as being like Kim Kardashian. <laughs> uh, do, you have a, do you have anything else to say on this point? Got a rather large derriere. I mean, it's a, it, to be fair, it's a, it's a lot larger than Kim. A lot, a lot larger. And, and there, is got, picture, there is a picture in, there is a picture yeah. in the book. Yes. And or it's got sparkly bits on it. It's got sparkly bits on it, which I think she would like herself, but um, is, and apparently when you see them flying and they're, they're, they're waving their bottoms and flashing away, it's quite something to behold. Fascinating. I will finish up on abdomens with this sentence because it struck me as being, well, peculiarly you, I thought. A species that has taken these lower abdominal brushes to the edge of good taste is the Mira Superba. I'll say that again because I was giggling. A species that has taken these lower abdominal brushes to the edge of good taste is the Mira Superba, identified by Alexander Henry Halliday, an Irish entomologist. Um, what is the Mira Superba and what is the edge of good taste? Well, they're enormous. And um, it's like, well, why, you know, I cannot, I think it is just, this is one of the species that has just gone slightly over the top. It's like, it, and it's like, I, you know, they, they, it's almost like they were like, well, I can do it, so I might as well try it. And it's like, oh, no, because also, <laughs> As a human looking at these, and I'm not the only one, we're all trying to figure out what all these different features mean. It kind of makes my sensibilities. I'm like, oh, um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to, as you know, someone to one, this is where I have to be careful because <laughs> I'm not comparing myself to the, the internal workings of a fly, you see. And so even I kind of get a bit like, oh, bit tongue tied about describing that fan-like structure, which it makes me blush. 
<laughs> Goodness me. Well, we'll now pass on to some serious science before we bring in a couple of people to um, uh, ask, to ask their own questions. Um, past climate states. Um, so I'll read to you a little bit again from your book. The shed skins actually decay, but interestingly, and as it transpires, helpfully for us scientists, the head capsules endure. In fact, they can remain intact for millions of years, and they are made, as they are made of sclerotized chitin, which is very durable. And in the case of one specific family, the Chironomidae, or non-biting midges, have helped scientists to understand previous climatic conditions. Yeah. I work with, the, the reason I'm at the Natural History Museum is because of the guy who invented the midge thermometer. So he was the one who worked on these previous uh, glacial events in the past and they were able to, because they know the chronomids prefer, different chronomids prefer, uh, prefer different environmental conditions. So we use them a lot nowadays as biological indicators, the living ones. So you would come across a lot of these like blood worms. So if you see a blood worm in a river, you know, mm, that's not very good, it's quite anoxic. So we have this whole range of oxygen concentrations that these coronamids can live in. And when their bodies leave behind, when their bodies uh, de de degenerate and their head capsule, which is nice, stays behind, you can identify the species by the teeth arrangement. This is the larval teeth. So when I was working on the wetland, he was like, Erica, this is how we do it. And he got me involved with the NHM and that was history. But he's been able to go back to subarctic, who was in Russia, up in the Arctic Circle. They were coring down and they were able to core down to the ice. So we're talking thousands of years ago. Look at what species of coronamid was there and say, OK, they have this oxygen requirement because we still have those species today. So it is, it's amazing what we could do, what these long dead creatures can tell us about previous climatic events and help us understand future climatic events. Quite, quite extraordinary. Um, at this point, David, could we bring in Anna Morris, who has a question for Erica? This will take just a Oh, no, Anna is about to appear. As soon as her microphone goes live, we will wait for her question. We, know we should be able to hear you now, Anna. Do you want to Bye. ask your... Hello. Hello. You, caught, you caught me just buying the book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And having a quick browse through the special offers as well. <laughs> awesome to hear you, Erica. I've been sitting here giggling away and I literally, I'll have to put the uh, Roy Dennis's cotton grass summer down to, to get stuck into the fly book. One <laughs> thing, it's a really, it's a really simple question now listening to all the, the really incredible stuff that flies do. But one thing I really notice in, in uh, it's usually one period in the summer where when I'm out walking in the woods, I can just hear this buzzing, constant buzzing, quite loud buzzing. And then I locate it to, to the hoverfly who's happily sitting on the leaf, buzzing away without seemingly moving a muscle. I can't see its wings moving. I can't see it doing anything that would, would, make, would enable it to make such a wonderful noise what are they doing Erica? Yeah uh, these are the big fat hoverflies aren't they? Yeah. Now this is a mating buzzing. Um, I only saw this last year because I heard this massive noise and I'm like what is that and it's beautiful fatties, real fluffy fatties and they are moving their wings okay we're just they're not moving them all the time and they're not engaging them into flying so but that is how they're making these vibrations. So it, it is quite extraordinary how they're doing it. I mean, what I'd really like, they're, they're doing now with a lot of the hoverflies, they're doing um, uh, lots of recording for flight. So there's a guy next door at Imperial College called, he's got the best name, Professor Holger Krapp. And he's the one who's studying all these hoverfly mechanics. And I would love him to actually properly do some recordings of this so you can sleep absolutely slowed down. There are vibrations of the wings going on. The um, Drosophila, a lot of them, they, they will change their wing patterns to sing to their future mates. So that's what your little lovely woodland fatty is doing. He's singing to woo the women, which is cute. It's, it's almost Wagnerian, isn't it? That's yeah, yeah, just like that. Uh, just a side question from me on that very point. Uh, bumblebee, so just 
fly a flag here for the Hymenoptera. Um, bumblebees, the things in the springtime, they actually raise their own body temperature by burning yeah. fat which they stored last autumn, this, type, this exact time of year as they're going into hibernation. And then they are capable actually of incubating their eggs in the same way as a chicken will buzz, well the chicken doesn't buzz, but the bees will buzz to pass warmth onto their eggs. Are there any cases of temperature regulation by buzzing in uh, diptera? Um, don't know. Um, I haven't looked into it, but that's, um, that doesn't mean because there's a lot going on. I, I know there's um, youth social flies in New Zealand, were they territory guard by buzzing? So, which is quite cute because the older males no longer are useless for any, like, you, you know, useless older males. So they're now guarding around. And so they, they probably zzz when anything comes near them. So they use that buzzing for that effect as well. But whether there's egg, I mean, it would make sense. It would make sense. So they were around before the hymenoptera, so probably we're doing it better. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Just throw that out there. Yeah. Well, certainly you talk about flies in extreme cold environments, uh, such as uh, Antarctica, such as extremely high up mountains in Asia. And yeah. America. So there would be every reason to think they might mechanically yeah. warm um, their, their larvae. The fact, the fact that some flies, because they've got such a temporal food source, so the ones living in decomposing bodies, can change between laying a larvae and laying an egg, really does show you that there are some amazing adaptations going on and that probably that is happening as well then. Fascinating. So at this point, David, could we bring, please, Jim into the conversation. So there's Jim appeared. We'll just wait for his microphone to go live. Jim, can you speak to us? I can, yes. Hello, Erica. Thank you. I really enjoyed that interview and it's wonderful to hear uh, you speak. Um, I, I mean, I'm down in uh, Devon and we have lots of house flies here, all kinds of flies. And um, I noticed during the day they will try to escape against the window. So they obviously have some sort of directional thing go towards the, the light. But in the evenings, when that isn't there, they seem to have this behavior of flying about midway between the room, really quite low. They'll fly for a bit, they'll go from room to room, and then they'll stop, they'll have disappeared, and then they'll, they'll start up again. And I just wondered, is there a pattern to this? In other words, are they following a pre program response or is it entirely random? Has anyone ever looked at it? Okay, this is the question I get asked all the time. Why do flies headbutt windows? And why do they fly around lampshades in the room? Um, so there's two different things going on here. Um, a, um, the window thing we are only just beginning to look at in terms of understanding fly vision. So um, A, well, they do not perceive windows in the same way we do. Um, flies will see in UVA, UVB and UVC. So a window, a pane of glass, gets rid of UVB B and C. So it's no longer what it quite appears to us. So it's going to interfere with them, which is why they kind of bang onto it. They don't actually headbutt it. If you look at um, ultra fine, they are going up to it all the time. Now, flies are quite myopic in some ways. They, they are got great visual acuity, but they have to be quite close. So they'll be relying on our senses. So by a window, you've got very limited wind. So it's, it's a nice area to be because if you've got lots of wind, it's a lot harder for the fly to figure out what's going on. So this is why they don't maybe want to go outside. Plus, no offense to you, but your house smells incredible to a fly. You have got, I mean, you have got food everywhere. You have got decomposing matter everywhere. We, uh, humans, we can't help it. We just produce it your sink, everything, it's just, you've got a smorgasbord to the average fly, the average house fly. So they're in and they're like brilliant. And the males are in waiting for the females. So they're less likely to want to go. So when we're trying to shoot flies out, flies are like, why? I'm, I'm very happy here. I don't, why are you doing this? Now at night, you've got different stimuli going on as well. Now flies, they taste with their feet and they leave chemical signatures behind. So when flies land on something, they can tell you who's been there before like loads of mini detectives. Ah, oh, Jeremy was here. Why was Jeremy here? We've got to figure out what's going on. And so what they're doing is that they're landing on the light shows again and again and again. And they're also flying in these kind of square patterns and they're flying like that. 
because actually that's a really good way of them to be able to sense the room and look around, plus avoid predators. Because as much as they're very clever, they still think that birds that can get to them. And if they fly in this kind of weird staccato fashion, it's really hard for birds to change quickly on the wing. So it's the best way for them to be evasive. So they will go around, they'll be smelling all your rooms, there'll be, um, your lights will be affecting them because they used to, if they're flying at night, they used to be flying by different signals. And so all of these like day things going on, night things going on, you've got a sensory overload going on in your house, which is why the flies are loving it. That's a very, a very ample answer. So I hope that satisfies Jim and his fascination with the flies who live around him. Now, very much earlier when we were talking about bee riders, Anna Morris asked for more information on bee riders and who they are in Diptera kind. So they're called brolids. We um, have a species in the UK, brolid co, I can't pronounce it correctly now. And they only live on honeybees. So they've been co coexisting with honeybees for an awfully long time. Uh, they're kleptoparasites, so they do absolutely no long-term damage to bees. It was interesting, I was looking up an old Hymenoptera course, speaking course, that said these were terrible parasites. So I went and found like the original authors, and they were like, oh, no, maybe there wasn't. And it was like, see, see, flies are always getting a bad name. Um, but sadly, in the UK, they were one of the losses caused by the use of miticides. So when the varroa mite came in and everyone went gung-ho and put all the miticides in, didn't actually get rid of the mite, but it got rid of the brolid. But the brolids uh, still exist on the islands around the UK, which is cool. And we found a few that now turned up in some colonies in the main area. I won't go into details because we're working on that, but it, it's very exciting to see them back now. Um, we wanted to, um, I didn't even know about feral bee populations. That was a novel and new interesting thing. I like the idea of loads of angry women have just flown off and they're, they're being feral somewhere. And um, there may be some on these colonies as well, but apparently working with feral bees is, is quite difficult. They're, they're not as nice and have a cup of tea as your hive bees are. But I, we're trying to figure out if we can go and sample some. So I hope that answers your question, Anna Morris. Um, Erica, I've made you talk for more than an hour. So I'm just going to, is there anything you feel you need to say about flies that we haven't covered? I, I just want people to go and have a look at them and go, I don't want people to go, oh, it's flies, they're all revolting. I want people to go and say, do you know what? They get up to everything and do everything. We're now all armed with smartphones, as it were. We've all got cameras. We can go out there and we can start properly looking. That piece of ivy that is just in flower at the moment, just go and have a look. It's covered in bees and wasps. But it's also absolutely covered in horror flies. And I want people to realize that flies are, are just amazing and fantastical. And there's so many of them for you to go and look at. Well, if ever there was an advocate who was going to make people do that, it is you. We have had, all of us, all of us listening have had a most amazing evening in Company. I cannot, cannot, cannot encourage people enough to buy uh, your book. So Erica, I, in a moment, I'll just say a couple of brief things about how people can buy your book again, but from all of us, a huge thank you. For being thank you very much. This evening. So if people are interested to buy Erica's book, don't forget that in the email that you've been sent, about this event, there will be a link where you can purchase it from Wild Sounds and Books, who are our partners at Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And by so doing, you will encourage Erica to write more wonderful books <laughs> about flies, but you'll also be making a 10% donation to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, thanks to uh, the generosity of Wild Sounds and Books. Um, should you wish yourselves to make a donation um, to say thank you for this evening, we would also be delighted. And there is a the link in the email but you can also help us hugely especially if you are somebody new to Norfolk Wildlife Trust and our client calling events by sending feedback to David Fieldhouse whose email address is also there because the National Lottery Heritage Fund who have funded this evening's event and all our other client calling events coming up that you can find at clycalling.com they love to hear your feedback so on that note another huge thank you to Erica thank you thank all you. very much for being with us this evening and good night.